Well, good evening. Let me try again. Good morning. It's good to see so many people here this morning. We want to welcome our visitors. We're glad you've chosen to be with us and to welcome all those who may be tuning in to our Facebook live stream on our Facebook page. We're happy you're tuned in as well. As it was stated earlier, I have a friend in town, Justin. I hope you get to meet him. Uh, it was, it has, as we talked, we got to find out it's been at least 21 or 22 years since we've seen each other. And as not only did I get reacquainted with him and reunited with him, but Matt as well. It's been some years since he's seen him. It was an amazing, wonderful thing to find out that no matter how much time has passed, his passion, his love, and zeal for God has not changed. And to see that, that faithfulness after all these years is, is an amazing thing. And it kind of ties in with our topic this morning as we deal with topics of faithfulness versus unfaithfulness. The lesson I prepared for you this morning is three chairs. We're going to be taking our base text from 2 Timothy 2, 1 to 2, but we're not going to get there right away. So if you do turn to 2 Timothy 2, 1 to 2, go ahead and place a marker. We're going to be looking at some other places first. I do want to give a disclaimer, though, before we get into this. This is going to sound dark and gloomy and might cause sadness. <laughs> but I want you to know, I'm not going to leave it like that. We're not going to leave on a cliffhanger. Uh, if you run out in tears, I won't be upset, but I do hope you come back because we're going to end on a positive note and one of hope. But if you look around congregations of the Lord's body just in our local area, and I'm not speaking for other areas I know nothing about, but just in our local area, you'll notice an age range that is missing in the majority of the congregations, and that is the 20s to 30s range. And it doesn't mean that we don't have a few or some, but this all sparked a few months ago. I received a phone call from a young man from another congregation in Richmond or just north of Richmond, and he was asking about the age demographic we had in our congregation, and he said he was looking for a group, a group of individuals from ages 23 to 32. And he asked me if we had such a group, and I started thinking, I was like, well, we've got, no, what well, we've got... Well, we have one or two, maybe three in that range. And I asked, I gave him a number of another preacher in Richmond and said, I'm not, I know they had some new converts. Talk to them because I, I heard they had three young men that just recently uh, were converted. So I gave him the name of my other preacher friend in Richmond. That guy called me back shortly thereafter and said he had this conversation with this guy. And he said, you know, we don't really have anyone in the age range he's looking for. And we got to talking, and as I made phone calls to a few other preachers, we realized the sad state of just in our local area, we don't have a lot of Christians in their 20s to 30s in our congregations. Many of our congregations have teens. We found we had that in common with each other. We have couples in late 20s to, to 30s, but not many of them. The alarm bells, as I started researching this for, to, to put a lesson together, I I looked at several different studies that have been conducted over the years, and alarm bells have been going off among the brotherhood and even in denominations who are suffering the same problem. They've been feeling this for decades. What is happening? Why are young Christians leaving the church? Well, I found a research study done in 2019 by Lifeway Research. It was conducted in January 2019, or at least that's when their test results were published. And I don't want to bore you with all the different statistics, but the one that is most pertinent to this morning's lesson. And what staggered me is it said it showed 66% of teens left Christianity. And a great percentage of that number did so at 18 when they went off to college. And I thought, how sad that these teens might have been full of zeal and love and on fire for God. And they go off to college and they leave the church entirely. What is happening? This means that nearly 7 in 10 teenagers who used to be active Christians left the faith. Well, I didn't just stay with one study. This got my curiosity, and I ended up looking at several other studies. And I'm not going to bore you with all the different studies. If you want to, the, this outline and the PowerPoint are both on the, on the website. And they have a sources page on the outline and the PowerPoint on this particular next 
slide I'm about to show you has all those same sources. So whether you're looking at the PowerPoint or the outline, you'd be able to follow links to every one of these studies. I just want to summarize 12 bullet points that I took away from these massive studies that I was reading at. Studies show various reasons why young Christians are leaving the church. Up at the top of the list is college and work. Next up is political or social activism. Either they disagree with the church's stance against what they perceive as a political or social ideology, they want, or, or they want the church to take a heavier stand on whatever side they land on. They perceive the church to be forsaking or resisting science. And I thought number four was also very telling. They marry non-Christians and slowly, or in some cases, one study said, swiftly drift away, most of them choosing not to raise their children with a Christian perspective or with their Christian faith. And I just have to ask, did they not hear the story of Solomon? Did they not learn the story of Solomon and what happened to him in his older years that the wisest man on earth had his heart stolen from God by his many wives and their idols? The list kept going on and on. It went on to say that many young Christians feel underutilized. That is, they don't feel useful or they, have, they don't have any responsibility in the work of the church, and so they feel useless. And nobody wants to stay in a place that you feel useless. And I thought, that's avoidable. We can change that. They feel marginalized. What they mean by that is they feel marginalized by older Christians who perceive or view them as underfoot or in the way of the work of the church. That's avoidable. That can be remedied. And then sadly, some leave the church because they feel as if they don't have or they've lost connections to others of their own age. And I fear that that's what was going on with that young man who gave me that call a couple months ago. And I know that he went and visited the West End congregation. And as I talked to Rob just recently, he hasn't been back. Some felt as if the church couldn't answer their why questions. They felt the church was too judgmental and or hypocritical. We've all heard those arguments. The church is full of hypocrites. Well, are there other social clubs not filled with hypocrites? <laughs> If they look at the church as a social club and wonder why there's hypocrites there and they say, I can't have anything to do with that, their sporting events, are they sitting next to hypocrites? Yeah, it's because we all need Jesus. We all need to be here. They feel the church is too exclusive. And as I read that bullet point and did some more research and one of the studies went into further detail, it says they buy into the all-inclusive mindset of the world, meaning they see no need to call out the sin of the LGBT crowd and others. That they want the church to just embrace it, come as you are and make no changes. They no longer believe in the mission or purpose of the church. And sadly, the last one, which I feel a lot of them probably fall under, they, went, they only went to church or they only became Christians to please someone else. How many times have we heard that story? A man or a woman is interested in, a, in a, a possible mate and that person converts so that they might marry that person and then afterwards their faith is zero to nil. And this is what this study was saying. They went to church to please someone else. A so-called Christian author named David Kinneman, he's the author of You Lost Me, he said in a Christian Chronicle article, it's a disciple-making problem. The church is not adequately preparing the next generation to follow Christ faithfully in a rapidly changing culture. And he said this back in 2012, 10 years ago. And while that what he says rings true, just looking about in our local area, it's not just the fault of the church, but the home as well. Children need to be taught by word and example in the home. Parents, if you don't make the assembly your priority, your children are going to see it. If you don't make Bible class your priority, your children will see it. If you don't take time to study and they don't see that and they don't study with you, they're not going to follow in that practice. Children need to be taught more than just on Sunday mornings or possibly Wednesday nights because if that's all they're getting, that's not enough to ground them in the truth. 
This can be seen in the three chairs theory of apostasy. Three chairs can represent this drift. When I thought about doing this, I, I really wanted to have three folding chairs up here in the front, but I was really worried they'd be stepped on and tripped over, that I might even fall over one, and I, I just thought I can't live with that. So I put up three pictures. I really was just thinking about this point, just using three chairs. So I want you to imagine these chairs. So I chose these colors. One is yellow, gray, or brown, but I want you to think of them as gold, silver, and bronze. All right? So I, I know what they look like. And even in the picture, as I saved them, I saved them as yellow, gray, and brown. But I want you to see gold, silver, and bronze. That's what I want you to be picturing. The first chair, the gold chair. The first generation is fired up, enthusiastic, dedicated to God. The second generation goes to services. They go through the motions. But the fire and zeal of that first generation is missing. The third chair, the third generation just doesn't care. And they give themselves completely over to sin. Now, before you start saying, wait a minute, I know different people like that. I want you to see, we're going to look at just three examples that the scriptures bear these chairs out. And we're going to look at three chairs examples from the scriptures. We're going to start with Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. Abraham is that gold chair. But here's why. <clears throat> In Romans 4, 9 to 16, he is called the father of our faith. It says he's the father of us all. James 2, 23, he was called the friend of God. As he traveled, he frequently built altars. It is recorded that he built four altars, specific mentions that he built four altars. Genesis 12, 7 and verse 8. I put 7 through 8, but that's kind of misleading. It's 7 is one altar, 8 is one altar. Chapter 13, 4 references back to chapter 12 and verse 8. So that doesn't really, it looks like 5, it's really 4. 13, 18 and Genesis 22, verse 9. These are the four altars that are recorded that Abraham built to God in his lifetime. Water is a precious commodity in life. Without water, we'll, start, we'll, we'll die of thirst. We will die. We have to have water. It's recorded that Abraham built one well. Genesis 21, 25, and verse 30, both, both of these passages speaking of the same well. But when he died, it says that the Philistines filled in all his wells, plural, in Genesis 26, 15, and verse 18, mentioned twice. So we know that he built or dug more than one well. But there's only one well specifically mentioned in the scriptures there in Genesis 21. Because the focus of Abraham was on the spiritual. Abraham's focus, no matter what his wanderings were, was spiritual. But the second chair, represented by his son Isaac, he worshipped God... See this in Genesis 26, 1 to 5, Genesis 26, 12 to 14, and verse 22, 24 to 25, and verses 26 to 30. But his faith was not as strong as Abraham's. You know what Isaac is known for? So Abraham's known for his altars. What would you guess Isaac was known for? Anyone? What guess? His wells. Isaac is recorded that he built five wells. And you can see this in Genesis 26, 19 through 20, 21, 22, 25, and verse 32. And it's recorded that he built one altar. And true to form, we're told he put a well next to it. In Genesis 26, verse 25. So already, you can see a shift towards worldly considerations. Right? It's only recorded he built one altar. Maybe he built others, but this one specifically is, is mentioned. He, re, he built five wells. To illustrate this drift towards worldly considerations, Isaac favored one of his sons because of the food that he brought to the table in Genesis 25, verse 28. Isaac's focus was physical. And this could be represented, the third chair is represented by his son Esau. Esau was very worldly. He married local women who did not worship God. And it says much to the, the consternation or the concern of his, his parents. In Genesis 26, 34 to 35, 36 verse 2. He despised his inheritance, that is his birthright. We're told that in Genesis 25, 29 to 34. And Hebrews 12, 15 to 17 records him as an immoral and godless person. And then we're told in Romans 9, 13 that God said, Jacob, I loved Esau I hated. Esau was very worldly. So do you see the, this three-chair theory holds up in the scripture? Abraham, the gold standard, the gold chair. Isaac, the silver chair. 
Esau the bronze? How many times did the children of the, 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 the religious leaders of Jesus they say we're children of Isaac? They say we're children of Abraham, right? They went back and focused on Abraham. The next set of trio that we want to look at, the next three chairs, is David, Solomon, and Rehoboam. David is called a man after God's own heart once in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel 13, 14. Once in the New Testament, Acts 7, verse 46. You know, as we read about the story of David, and that he was just described as a man after God's own heart, and no one can ever take that away from him. He wasn't always a good king and husband. He committed adultery with Bathsheba. He murdered her, her husband, Uriah, who was one of his mighty men. These were the guys he entrusted his life to. What a betrayal. There that we see in 2 Samuel 11 through 12 and David's own words about it in Psalm 51. He was not always a successful father. His son Ammon raped his half-sister Tamar in 2 Samuel 13, 7 to 20. Another son, Absalom, attempted to overthrow David and laid in public with his concubines in 2 Samuel chapters 15 to 18. Another son, Adonijah, as David's on his deathbed, tried to overthrow David and become king in his place in 1 Kings chapter 1, 5 to 6. But through all of that, he had a heart of repentance. Psalm 51 tells us that he knew that God requires a broken and contrite heart and spirit. But I think the best, the best tell of how David is viewed in the scripture is he becomes the standard for all other kings. This is just a sampling. Do a word search. Do a word search throughout 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, especially 2nd Chronicles, David's in 1st Chronicles. But he's the standard for all of the kings. It'll say something like this, as in 1st Kings 14, 7 to 8, 15, 3 through 5, 15, 11, 2nd Kings 18, 3. It'll say something like this, that such, so, such king followed God with all his heart like his father David had done. Or such and such king went after the idols of the land and committed evil, not... Righteous like David, his father, had done. It would say of David that David did not part to the left or to the right, and that this king either did that or this king did something different. David became the gold standard for which all other kings are judged by, by the narrator and kings and the chronicler of the chronicles. His heart and his focus on God were always spiritual. And there's no, in, in my mind, one of the best passages to turn to and I encourage you to read it on your own. It's 1 Chronicles chapter 29. Here you see David addressing the assembly, him addressing his son, and God is at the forefront of everything he says. God was on his mind before he passed out of this life. But his, the silver chair can be represented by his son Solomon. David's son Solomon was chosen by God to be king, 1 Chronicles 29.1. This is something David says to the assembly, so there is no misunderstanding why it's not Adonijah. He loved God. He often prayed to him. He even asked for wisdom in 1 Kings chapter 3 and chapter 8. He spent seven years building the temple, 1 Kings 6, 37 to 38. But then do you see the worldly shift? He spent 13 years building his own palace. Have you ever thought of that? Seven years on the temple, 13 years on his own house. 1 Kings chapter 6, 37 to 38. I'm sorry, 1 Kings 7, 1 is where it talks about his palace being 13 years. That worldly shift was happening. And then in his older years, he followed his many foreign wives in idolatry. Not that he just tolerated each one of these foreign wives to have their own nation's gods, but it says he actively participated in it with them. Did he know who God was? Yeah, no, no doubt. He spoke to God. God gave him in 1 Kings chapter 3, this wonderful opportunity. He said, ask me anything you want and I will give it. This is like that genie in the bottle moment everybody hopes and prays for. And he says, I want wisdom. And God said, because you asked for wisdom, I'm giving you long life, I'm giving you riches, I'm giving you glory. I'm giving you all the other things that other men would have asked for on top of wisdom. And so it's sad that the wisest man who ever lived was focused on the physical. And his son, Rehoboam, can be represented by that bronze chair. Under his rule, the kingdom was split, 1 Kings chapter 12. Under his rule, Judah went after idols, no longer serving God like the house of David had done. 1 Kings 14, 22 to 24. 
because his focus was worldly. The last trio we want to look at. The three chairs can be representative of Joshua, Israel's elders, and Israel in general. Joshua and his house served the Lord. Joshua 24, 15, he famously said, Choose this day who you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then for Israel's elders, that second chair, it says the people served God during all of Joshua's life and during the lives of the elders who served Joshua and survived Joshua. Joshua 24, verse 31, spells that out. But then the bronze chair people. After that second generation died out, it says a generation arose that did not know God. This is the third generation. It's not that many years removed from the death of Joshua. Judges chapter 2, 10 through 13. First chair people put their emphasis on serving God. Hebrews 11, 8 to 16, we're told this world is temporary. And like Abraham, first chair people, people of faith, will seek a better country. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the necessities of life, going back several verses, will be added to you. First chair people, seek God. You see that in Abraham. You see it in David. And you see it in Joshua. Second chair people. Second chair people begin a blurring of godliness and worldliness. And you see that with Isaac with his wells and his food. You see it with Solomon, with his many wives. Christians cannot be the bride of Christ and be the girlfriend of Satan. Because that's what second chair people begin doing. Didn't we see that with Isaac? Didn't we see that with Solomon? Didn't we see that with Israel beginning after the death of Joshua? Christians cannot be the bride of Christ and be the girlfriend of Satan. And so many Christians think they can. The church of Laodicea, Jesus had nothing good to say about them because they had compromised with the world that they were no, neither hot, they were neither cold. They were what? A yucky, lukewarm. He said it made him sick and he was going to vomit them out. It begins with second chair people. Once the drifting begins, it's hard to stop unless we recognize it, unless we have that slap in the face, so to speak, that call that wakes us up and says the path you are on is going to have devastating consequences for the third chair people. Wake up and do what's right. So I know we can do better. How can we do better? It's hard enough for dedicated people to raise faithful children. When one is only loosely committed, their children are going to push faster and farther away. The drift starts with a desire for this world. That's what Galatians 4.9 tells us. Sin causes love to grow cold. This is what Jesus said in Matthew 24.12. This is what happened to the church at Ephesus in Revelation 2.4-5. through 5. After Jesus says sin will cause love to grow cold, he then condemns the church at Ephesus and says that they had left their first love and they needed to repent. It wasn't something light. This was something that would cost them their lampstand, cost them their souls individually. And Jesus says you needed to repent. Primarily, from what I've seen, is the drift is caused by incomplete teaching. Teaching is to be done in the home by both parents. Proverbs 1.8 and Proverbs 6.20. I told you we were going to look at a passage before we get to 2 Timothy. Look over with me in Proverbs chapter 1.8 because I'm going to reference it more than just this once. But in Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 8, and then we're going to turn over to chapter 6 and verse 20. Proverbs 1 and verse 8. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Are both parents involved in the training of this child? Your father's instruction, your mother's teaching. Look in Proverbs 6 and verse 20. My son, observe the commandment of your father, and do not forsake the teaching of your mother. Bind them continually on your heart, he says. So many times we hear, and, it, and it, there is accuracy to it, we hear that teaching falls on the shoulders of the Father. And that's true. He bears the responsibility for that. Ephesians 6.4 tells us teaching is the Father's responsibility. 
But do you see how important it is that they don't just hear it from one parent? They don't just see it from one parent. They need to see it from both. Both mother and father need to take a hand in the training and teaching of righteousness to their children. God warned the Israelites to diligently teach lest they forget in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 7. And I think too often we hope that our example will be enough. But then I have to ask, what example did Isaac give his sons? What example did Solomon give his children? Why do we read of the nation going so wrong? Families going so wrong. Example is important. But we need more than just the example. We need the training. We need the teaching. Train the next generation in the home. Proverbs 1.8, Proverbs 6.20 says that. 2 Timothy 3.16-17 says, All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Train the next generation in the church. It is a responsibility of the church as well. 2 Timothy 2, 1 to 2, our text that I told you we would get to. You can read it from your own device, your Bible, your device of your choice, or the slide above me, or just listen to the sound of my melodious voice. You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Do you see what Paul is telling Timothy here? He's writing this letter. So here's the the aged apostle, the, the teacher, writing to a fellow preacher, a younger man. And he says, You therefore be strong in the grace in Christ. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. He says, This wasn't done in secret. He says, Entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Paul isn't just entrusting it to Timothy. When we read through First and Second Timothy, these words are not just for Timothy alone. They weren't even just for Timothy and the faithful men Timothy was to teach. They were for others also. Teaching doesn't just happen overnight. It's not through osmosis. It is training. It is practice. It is teaching. It is spending time with people. I think it's an amazing thing that Paul is saying here. Because Timothy was in Ephesus. And he's telling him, you take these things that you have learned, you entrust them to faithful men who are then going to teach other people. We can do better. We need to direct your efforts to teaching the Word of God to your families in word and by example. And when I say you, I am including me in there. We can do better. We need to do better. Now, you might be here this morning. You might be saying, oh, no. I'm a first chair person. And now I'm scared for my grandchildren. You might be here as a second chair person saying, I'm worried about my kids. I don't want to leave you on the doom and gloom that we just looked at. (laughs) Because there is hope. There is hope. A positive note we can look at both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. The three chairs of apostasy theory isn't all bad. We talked about Abraham and Isaac, but you notice we did not talk about Jacob. Jacob was favored by God. Romans 9.13, I love Jacob, God says. He had a faithful relationship with God. Genesis 28.10-22. He's in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11 and verse 21. The Holy Spirit included Jacob in this cloud of witnesses, as it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, that gives us hope that knowing that if he could do it, I can do it. His name was changed to Israel in Genesis 32, 22 22 to 32, and the angel says it's because he fought with God, he fought with men, and he won. That's an amazing honor that God bestowed on him to change his name to something that happened like that. And then it becomes indicative of all his descendants, doesn't it? Israel fought with God, and they rarely won. (laughs) But here Jacob was given this name because he fought with men and with God, and he won. Jacob's teaching stuck with Joseph, his son. I encourage you to read this on your own, but Genesis 50, 15 to 21, where Joseph, after Jacob has died, 
And his brothers are worried that now he's going to exact vengeance. Joseph says, oh no. What you meant for evil, God meant for good so that all these lives may be saved. I will take care of you and your little ones. You know, Joseph is one of those rare characters that no fault or sin is recorded. Doesn't mean he didn't have it. Romans 3.23 tells us otherwise. But he's one of those rare characters that it's not recorded. Joseph, too, is mentioned by the Hebrew writer in the Hall of Faith. Because Jacob's focus, no matter what his wanderings were, no matter how other people treated him, Jacob's focus was spiritual. Jacob was a first chair person. He was the third chair, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But he was faithful. That's the positivity note. And here's three chairs that we can look at. And Lois, Eunice, and Timothy. Lois, we're told in 2 Timothy 1.5, had a sincere faith. Who was Timothy? Timothy was the son of a Greek father and a Jewish Christian mother named Eunice. He's the grandson of Lois. We see that in Acts 16.1 and 2 Timothy 1.5. Lois, we're told, had a sincere faith. 2 Timothy 1.5. Her daughter, Eunice, the second chair, also had that sincere faith. And they both trained Timothy from a child in God's Word. We're told that in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 15. She's a faithful first chair, even though she's second generation. And Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, 1 to 2. We're told in the book of Acts, and then later, Paul calls him his son in the faith. Timothy was converted to Christianity by Paul. He was a faithful preacher of the gospel. Paul tells him to, to preach the word in season and out of season, to be ready to rebuke, to reprove, and to correct, and to train in righteousness. This gives us hope. So if you're sitting here this morning saying, I'm a first chair person, I'm worried about my kids and my grandkids, there is hope. Lois was a golden chair. Her daughter Eunice was a golden chair and Timothy was a golden chair. We see three chairs, all gold, with Lois, Eunice, and Timothy. And the hope I want to leave you with is the third chair can be faithful. We don't have to let that apostasy roll and continue that horrific state, that cycle of unfaithfulness. The third chair can be faithful. So how do we stop the drift? If you are a third chair person today who's drifted from God, I'm going to be blunt. You need to get right with God, for you are lost without Him. There is no hope without Him. 2 Thessalonians 1, 6-9 says, Those who do not know God and those who have not obeyed the gospel will be punished for an eternity and sent away from the presence of the Lord for all eternity. No second chances, no crying out for mercy. His face is turned away from you. Today, if you are here as a second chair person, I want you to look at what God told the Laodicean church in Revelation 3, 14-19. He says they were lukewarm. Like second chair people, they began compromising with the world. They're a bad-tasting water. They made Jesus sick, and he wanted to vomit them out. They keep those who are cold from seeing what hot is like. They keep throwing cold water on the hot. But God gives them the solution. Jesus says in verse 18, turn to God. Verse 19, be zealous. Verse 19, repent. And verse 20, rededicate your life to God. Get to work is what Jesus is saying. There's work to be done, and you need to do it. It's hard to be zealous and be lukewarm at the same time. In fact, it's an impossibility. You cannot be zealous and be lukewarm. You're either going to be zealous to the cold or to the hot. Jesus says, I wish you were cold or at least hot, but not lukewarm. Be zealous, he says. Repent and rededicate your life of service to God. And if you are a first chair person this morning, hang on to your faith. People need you, and we all need your example. Now is not the time to give up and throw away our great reward. That's what the Hebrew writer said in Hebrews 10, 35 to 36. Revelation 2, verse 25. The saints there were told to hang on to what they had. And if you're a first chair person, teach your children. And if possible, teach them more than what you currently know. My prayer for my children is that they'll be more full of zeal and faith than even I have. That I don't want them to make the mistakes that I make that I've made in my life. I want their hearts to be full of fire and zeal for God all the days of their lives. 
Teach your children. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2. And 2 Timothy 2 verses 24 to 26 says, The bondservant of Christ. He's not talking about elders. He's not talking about deacons. Not even the preacher or the Bible school teacher. He says all saints. All saints are the bondservant of Christ. He says you need to be able to teach. And the reason is that you can save people from the snare of Satan and bring them back. That's what we want for our children. That's what we want for our loved ones. As I look at these staggering numbers in these studies, all I can say is we can do better. I can look at the life of Lois, Eunice, and Timothy, and I say we can do better. We can stop the drift with love, with zeal, with training in righteousness, a focus on spiritual priorities, and a heart that turns towards God. And others around us will see that. They can live by our teaching and by our example. But there is hope. We can do better, and we can see it in the scriptures that it works. So I hope that I haven't depressed you too much. But to leave on a note of positivity and hope, that with love in your heart, with zeal, that training in righteousness and focusing on spiritual things, the altar is over the well. You can teach others. You can make it over the finish line. And this morning, if you're not a Christian, you need to become one because you haven't even begun the race and you need to run it with endurance and set aside sin that easily entangles, as Hebrews 12 says. You need to become a Christian to repent and be baptized today. And if you are a Christian who has strayed away, you have erred. Maybe you're that first chair or second chair Christian and things haven't been going well and you've been straying. Now's the time to recognize it. Now's the time to make it right. And if we can assist you in anything this morning, the waters of baptism, the prayers of the congregation on your behalf, you have but to come forward. Let your request be made known. Now, all together we stand and sing.